Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's seminar. A gene expression-based screening platform for mouse models of late onset Alzheimer's disease, presented by Dr. Greg Carter, an associate professor at the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Susie Valdez, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by NanoStream. For more information about our sponsor, visit them at www.nanostring.com. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and type those questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on the ask a question box and let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credit tab that's located on the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Dr. Greg Carter. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, Dr. Carter. Thank you. I'm very much looking forward to talking about our work in late onset Alzheimer's disease and how we're using a new gene expression-based screening platform to help understand how our models reflect the disease. So I'll begin with an outline. So first, I wanna tell you some of the science behind our work, creating and characterizing new mouse models for Alzheimer's disease. I wanna discuss how we're using a new catalog of transcriptomic alterations observed in clinical cohorts to understand late onset Alzheimer's disease or load. And then I'm going to tell you how this work has helped with a new Encounter mouse AD panel from Nano, that we've designed with Nanostring. And then finally, I'll finish with how we're using that panel to understand our mouse models. All of this work begins at the NIH Alzheimer's Disease Summit a few years ago. The NIH holds a summit every couple of years to bring the field together and discuss new directions and new requirements to really tackle Alzheimer's disease and sort out some treatments and potential cures. In 2015, it was noted that we need a new generation of in vivo models based upon human data to explore Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And that's primarily due to the advances in genetics, genomics, and other assay technologies, as well as imaging, now being uh, piloted in clinical studies. That leads us to the next generation of in vivo models and I'll be talking about our mouse models. We also need to establish standardized and rigorous processes for developing and characterizing these models. This is where some of these gene expression assays really come in handy. They allow us to standardize our analysis across all strains and come up with processes for analysis of those strains. We're also ensuring maximal and rapid availability to all researchers for preclinical drug development as that's what our aim really is with these strains, to provide preclinical tools. That will require that we align the pathophysiology of these animal models so that we can correspond them back to translatable biomarkers that are clinically relevant. And finally, we're establishing rigorous preclinical testing guidelines in those animal models, reporting both positive and negative findings. All of these requirements that we're following ended up in the Model AD Consortium, which was funded following this summit, and that's the Model Organism Development and Evaluation for Late Onset Alzheimer's Disease. It's a consortium that is embedded within a series of consortia funded to help tackle Alzheimer's disease. Our, our mission is to expand animal research models for basic research and preclinical testing of candidate therapeutics, and we're aiming for 50 new mouse models of Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's-related pathology over five years. Our mission is really built around the idea that existing mouse models have been based upon early onset, rare genetic variation that drives uh, fewer than 5% of Alzheimer's cases observed worldwide. And so there are transgenic models based upon these rare genetic variants, and these models tend to produce a lot of amyloid in the brain of the mouse, therefore are excellent tools for studying amyloid deposit. 
However, they don't show the full spectrum of late onset related uh, phenomena that you see in the majority of individuals, over 95% of the public that get Alzheimer's disease, tend to get late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So we would like to use the genetics in particular that we've learned about late onset Alzheimer's disease now in the GWAS area to create new mouse models that can reflect the spectrum of pathology and Alzheimer's dementia. And so our first goal is to create these new models of late onset, and we're using CRISPR technologies primarily to do that. We then do high capacity screening of all the models, including the gene expression panel I'll be talking about today, as well as deep phenotyping of the models that look most promising after we do the screening. That deep phenotyping involves imaging, uh, as well as other omic analyses. Once we have these data, we align the mouse data back to the human data, and I'll, I'll show some examples of this as well, where we want to understand what neuropathology, what omic signals, systems biology signals, or imaging signals that we're seeing in a given mouse that matches a human phenotype. We then move the most promising models that we can match to a potential therapeutic to preclinical testing, and we've been piloting that as well. And finally, all of the models as well as, well as the data are broadly distributed with no restrictions on access. And so that's public, private, whatever. Uh, the models are out there so that people can, uh, can pursue their own basic or preclinical research in Alzheimer's disease. This consortium is organized across a number of institutions, Indiana University, the Jackson Laboratory, Sage Bio Networks, and the University of California in Irvine. And it, within that consortium, we have a number of components. So there's a large bioinformatics and data management core with members from all institutions, a disease modeling project that's being carried out at the experimental sites, the Jackson Lab, Indiana University, and Irvine. And finally, preclinical testing, which is being done at Indiana University, the Jackson Lab, information's being organized at Sage Bio Networks. And we also have a new partner in, in Pittsburgh. Our first step, of course, is to create these models. And we're doing this using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology for the most part in the mouse models. This is a, still a fairly new technology, but one that has been proven to be extremely effective in mouse modeling. And we have large capacity to do this at the Jackson Laboratory, where our mission is to provide uh, mouse models of human disease. So here's an outline of how that works. We basically ingest CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNAs into zygotes through embryonic transfer. That produces mosaic mice, which we then breed to produce heterozygous mutants that we can then breed to produce homozygous mutants of the given mutation we're interested in. We have already created quite a few of these models that are now available through the Jackson Laboratory. There's a humanized EPP. There are a few small differences in the amyloid beta precursor sequence between human and mouse. So we've humanized that with the humanized A-beta knock in mouse. We've also introduced the APOE allele series. E2, E3, and E4 alleles are all in these mice now so that we can study the most commonly associated factor uh, in Alzheimer's disease, the APOE gene. We've also introduced a number of TREM2 variants. So these are relatively rare, but uh, are, lead to fairly high odds ratios in the association studies, in particular the R47H mutation in TREM2, a point mutation that we have introduced into the mouse. Now, given that we want a background for this complex disease that will be sensitized towards pathology, our base strain is a what we call the B6HAT. So that's the standard Black 6, C57 Black 6J mouse strain, where we've introduced both the homozygote APOE4 mutation as well as homozygote TREM2 R47H. So that's HAT for humanized APOE TREM2. That's our baseline strain. We've started to add additional Alzheimer's associated variation to that background. So for instance, we have a B6HAT, ABCA7 point mutation strain that's been associated with Alzheimer's disease, as well as an ABCA7 knockout strain, as that point mutation may be a loss of function, so we want to consider the knockout as well. We have a class 2 mutation, PLGC2, uh, et cetera. Those mice are now available. Coming this summer, we have a, the next round of uh, variants, including humanized complement receptor 1, IL1 RIP knockout, uh, point mutation KIF21B, point mutation in MTHFR, a CACAM1 knockout, and point mutations in SORL1 and SNX1, um, both part of the retromer pathway. So we are continuing to create new mice. Again, we're aiming for 50 in total, um, doing about eight to 10 variants per year over the next five years or over the five-year period. We're two years in right now. 
We're also humanizing the tau locus. So of course, tau pathology is a major component of Alzheimer's disease. And there are a number of potential splice variants and isoform variants in the human that may or may not be recapitulated in the mouse tau. So we're humanizing that gene so that we have the uh, faithful human tau in the mouse so that we can then add additional mutations, uh, which may further drive pathology according to GWAS. All of these models are uh, up, kept in an updated table at the modelad.org webpage. Once we create these models, our real question is, how do we align the, the human pathology with a given mouse model? Again, it's a complex disease. So at first, we don't expect any of these models to have full late onset Alzheimer's pathology. However, we can pick them apart. We can do MRI as well as PET imaging to match back to the human imaging studies, particularly ADNI. We can do neuropathology, of course, match that back to the human. And finally, we can do a lot of genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, so these omics studies that allow us to do really direct homology com uh, comparison between the human and mouse as genes are overwhelmingly shared between the two species. To do this, we really need to go to the human data and allow the human data to tell us what is relevant in our mouse. And fortunately, there's quite a data universe for Alzheimer's disease um, that's just recently expanded. These include things like the Alzheimer's Disease Sequencing Project, the Alzheimer's Disease, uh, uh, disease Neuroimaging Initiative, and what I'm showing here, which is the Accelerating Medicine Partnerships for Alzheimer's Disease. Here is the AMP-AD Knowledge Portal, which is hosted by Sage Bionetworks and available at this URL. Here you can access content across multiple studies, multiple data types. In particular, we're interested in the human genomics of late onset Alzheimer's disease right now. And there have been three major studies that are all in the AMP-AD data sets. There's a cohort from the Religious Order Study and Memory Aging Project at Rush University, ROSMAP, of 700 individuals with dorsolateral prefrontal cortex samples. Mount Sinai Brain Bank, 300 samples from a number of brain regions. And Mayo Clinic, 270 samples from cerebellum and temporal cortex. Of course, these are all post-mortem samples uh, in cohorts that are enriched, generally balanced for Alzheimer's disease, uh, mild cognitive impairment, um, as well as some, some non-effective controls. So this really gives us a broad assessment of how Alzheimer's disease, at least at the endpoint, has affected multiple brain regions in three different, uh, uh, different populations from around the United States. Now, all of these studies have been published, and I'm showing the references here. This was a series of papers that appeared in Scientific Data. Um, these are all the individual study cohorts analyzed individually and presented along with the additional information, for instance, um, any uh, proteomics and or uh, uh, clinical data they have for these cohorts uh, from those studies. However, what has also been done is a meta-analysis across all of those studies. And this allows us to basically harmonize across those studies, bring all of the data together, and provide a common baseline and a common catalog of potential variation in gene expression due to Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so this begins with the multi-method co-expression network analysis, where all of the data reprocessed in a harmonized way, and that includes some sample swaps across the different groups, uh, so that all of the uh, sequencing technologies can be aligned. We then take all those data and use a variety of, net of network analyses. So commonly used techniques such as uh, WGCNA, along with some newer techniques like Magina and Trina, um, all, all uh, are operating on all of these data, allowing us to find clusters of co-expressed genes that can be related to Alzheimer's disease. Each of those comes up with clusters, and from those, we find consensus modules, consensus clusters that are reproducible across all of those different techniques in all of these different studies. We then ask if any of those modules are enriched for genes that are differentially expressed in cases versus controls, right? Because we really want the modules that are related to Alzheimer's disease pathology. And we found a number of those, and that gives us a set of Alzheimer's-associated co-expression gene modules from human cohorts. And I want to show you what we found. We found, in fact, 30 co-expression modules that are related to late onset Alzheimer's disease. And I'm showing them here. And this is a matrix view of the overlaps in gene content between these modules. Okay, so what the first thing you see is, of course, there are a few uh, very strongly overlapping groups of modules. And this is because we tend to see similar pathology in the different studies and or the different brain regions. 
It's finding the consistency in outputs across all these studies. And as we start to look into what these blocks are, we can do analyses such as cell type specificity. So we ask if the genes within these modules are enriched in certain cell type signatures, mostly that have been derived from recent uh, single cell RNA-seq analysis. And you can see that sure enough, they are. The first mo module blocks are strongly enriched in astrocyte endothelial and microglial cells, or, or microglial genes. And so this is suggesting a strong inflammation component. Uh, the next block is strongly enriched in neuron-related genes. And that, that next block then is, is strongly enriched in myelin, uh, myelin gene, in ole, uh, uh, um, oligodendrocyte genes. And so we can start to apply some functional annotations to these, noting that the first block is astrocytes. The next is really the inflammatory component, a combination of astrocytes, endothelial, and microglial genes. We have a large neuron suggesting neurodegeneration. We have large oligodendrocyte and glial genes, suggesting things like uh, adjustments in myelination, perhaps decay of myelination. And then finally, there's a set of mixed modules that have to do with things like stress response and st response to unfolded proteins that are relevant to Alzheimer's disease and as, as we understand some of the pathology, for instance, with amyloid. And so these tend to be more, uh, uh, more unique in different brain regions is what we found, um, perhaps across different studies as well. Okay, so this is our baseline, understanding the cell types. We can, of course, also um, note that many of those stress response are not cell type specific. So these may be throughout many cells within the brain. Next, we looked at known pathways for Alzheimer's disease to see if, basically, if there's an overlap between these modules and these module blocks and known associations, for instance, genes in dbGaP, um, genes that have shown up in the iGaP, a very large UOS study, uh, KEG pathways related to Alzheimer's disease, OMIM annotations, et cetera. And what we find is that the three major blocks, astrocytes, inflammation, and neuron, are all strongly enriched in this known information, whereas when we look at the oligodendrocyte as well as those stress response modules, they're not represented in the published gene sets, in the annotated gene sets. Okay, so that might be some new information that we're getting uh, from these modules in particular, that, of course, is joined by this known information, giving us a more complete catalog of Alzheimer's pathology. Finally, we can look for sex-specific signatures. These populations are fairly balanced in terms of males and females. And maybe a little surprisingly, maybe not, we're seeing very strong enrichment across these different modules and these different module blocks across different studies um, in male versus female um, effects. So for instance, we see uh, the inflammation in both males and females, but it's, it's stronger in females, microglial activation, for instance. Um, whereas we're seeing stronger loss of neurons, at least at the gene expression level in females than males. Okay, so this also sets up some interesting questions when we think about modeling. We're, of course, modeling both sexes in our mouse studies, and so we can also look to align this back and understand how our mouse models may reflect or not reflect in some cases the sex-specific differences that one sees in clinical studies. OK, so this, this set up a question for us. How do we take a mouse model and effectively screen its gene expression patterns relative to all of these very diverse and very interesting Alzheimer's-related modules in humans? Um, ultimately, we can do RNA-seq, but on a sample-by-sample -sample basis, uh, doing, a, say, a high-food high capacity screen, we wanted a, a, a somewhat quicker option where we could really get at this information in a more effective way. And, and that's when we turned to the nanostring group and helped them develop the Encounter mouse AD panel. So what this is is a panel of 770 mouse gene probes with an option to add up to 30 additional custom genes in a given study um, that allows us to cover these 30 AMP AD modules. And we really tried to maximize coverage across all of the modules. We've also included things like the top AMP AD candidates. So there have been an, uh, quite a bit of work in prioritizing candidates in the Accelerating Medicines Partnership. Um, we've made sure to include all of their genes, such as their top 30, uh, as well as their Agora targets. Agora is a platform they have to uh, uh, agglomerate information around these gene expression signatures and really prioritize targets. And then given that, we ranked all of the genes by representation in the modules, and not only just representation in terms of, say, a centralized uh, principal component or centroid for, for a given module, but also we go deeper and look 
across module principal components and make sure that we're getting maybe some secondary signals in those modules, which in fact are very large. Some of them are thousands of genes. Okay, so that allows us to score every gene as to how central it is for a number of dimensions within each module. We then wanted to make sure that there was expression in the mouse, right? This is a mouse panel, so we want to see genes that are expressed in the mouse brain. So we validated orthogonal uh, expression in the mouse at six months of age. And finally, we added 10 housekeeping genes, which are very useful for normalizing across the, uh, the uh, nanostring platform and multiple samples. And so after doing this, we, our coverage ranges from about 76 to 278 genes in each module. Note again that the modules overlap strongly. So of course, many of these genes that we select and put on this panel are representing many modules. OK, so how does this panel work? Well, so what Nanostring's molecular barcodes do is provide digital detection technology capable of a highly multiplexed analysis of up to 800 RNAs. Um, they also have DNA and protein targets as well. Here we're looking at RNAs. And like I said, we, we selected 770 key genes with the option of 30 custom probes per, per uh, experiment. What happens is a couple of probes hybridize directly to a target molecule in solution. So this all happens in solution. There is no amplification required. Um, after hybridization, the samples are transferred to the end counter instrument, and that removes excess probes, um, then binds the purified target probe complexes, and immobilizes and aligns to an imaging surface so that uh, we can quantify the end counter output. They're then scanned by automated fluorescent micro microscopy, barcodes are counted for each target molecule, and data are exported. And I'll show you how simple that file format is. And so overall, this platform provides a, a relatively simple, precise quantitative analysis for nucleic acids, in this case, messenger RNAs. OK, back to the genes. Here's an example of some of those gene rankings I talked about and how we prioritize the genes. So here I'm showing prioritized candidates actually within one of those modules, a temporal cortex green module uh, from, from one of the cohorts. We found the genes within that module. Again, there are many. So we asked which ones, um, first of all, have a mouse homolog. So there's a human and mouse gene signal in both cases. Um, we looked at those, again, that are expressed in the mouse brain. All of these are expressed very well with TPMs, at least four in this group. Um, we also uh, computed the module gene rank score. So this is looking across the principal components of the module, how important and how central is that gene. That's what the ranking is based on in this list. Um, of course, taking the absolute value so that so that we can see both up and down regulated genes relative to the, the module principal components. And then finally, we, we made sure and annotated if, for instance, a gene like PAK1 was a drug discovery target that's been prioritized by AMP-AD. Okay, so we did this for all genes, and that's where we came up with our ranking to cover most modules, and our coverage looks like this. So as we look across the modules, uh, across the entire 30, uh, you can see that in many of these cases, there are thousands of genes in the modules. And that's why we're in a log scale here, because the, the module memberships actually go up to almost 5,000 for some of these modules. The smallest ones are about 500. So this is a pretty broad um, catalog, again, of Alzheimer's disease. And we wanted to cover these modules evenly uh, and cover each of them well. And so again, you can see that we range from about 78 to over 200 genes per module. Uh, there's at least 5% coverage in every module. Um, and so, and we've also, again, picked the most central genes to the various dimensions within each module. Okay, so this allows us a pretty comprehensive overview of what pathologies related to Alzheimer's disease, at least at the RNA level, that a mouse might be showing. Okay, given this, we wanted to uh, try it out on some of our models of CROPE, of course. And so I want to show you some results from an example mouse study. So these are, this is our first round of models. So, and I'm showing these because these are the modules we've had, or models we've had time to both create and age to 14 months um, and assay. So this is a, a, a data set of 144 samples from our model AD mice. And here we have four strains. So we have the black six control, again, that's C57, black six J, the standard laboratory mouse. Um, that's our baseline mouse that we're going to model on top of in model AD. We have taken that. We've added the APOE4 allele, so that's a knock-in uh, that replaces the mouse APOE with human APOE, and in particular, the E4 allele. 
We then uh, took another strain, which is the R47H point mutation, which, we, which we've crispered into the mouse because there's good homology in the TRAM2 gene between human and mouse. We're able to CRISPR in the R47H point mutation. And then finally, that B6HAT model, the baseline of our, all of our uh, forth, forthcoming mouse models, uh, which is the APOE4 and TRAM2 R47H double mutant. That's our sensitizer for what is to come. We looked at three different ages, four, 18, and 14 months. So that's basically one, uh, one age that's coming right out of development at the four month, uh, sort of middle aged mouse at eight months, uh, an early older age mouse, I would say at 14 months. We're also further aging these mice out to 24 months to get a really uh, elderly mouse. Um, we don't have those data yet because we're still aging in cohorts, um, but this gives us at least a start at some of the aging processes um, that we can assess in these mice. Of course, we looked at both males and females. We're doing that for all of our models within model AD. And we looked at six replicates for each of these cohorts, and that's how we get to 144 samples. Okay, so that's our standard for doing genomics is six replicates. So that's what we're using for the, um, for the uh, encounter uh, mouse AD panel. Each sample was normalized to the geometric mean of the 10 housekeeping genes, and then we log transformed all values, sort of the standard way that uh, people tend to analyze the nanostring data, which matches very closely to what one does with RNA-seq data. Um, now, I, I do want to note that these are still fairly young mice, and th these are not Mendelian drivers of, all, of Alzheimer's disease, which means that these mice actually don't have a lot of Alzheimer's disease uh, pathology in the brains yet. Um, again, it was only 14 months, that's you know, maybe a 50-year-old human. Um, so we're continuing to age these mice further to see if they do develop pathology. Um, however, we know that in humans, just having APOE4 and TREM2, R47H, probably isn't enough to drive Alzheimer's disease alone. There are probably other genetic factors, other contributing factors that need to be there. And so um, at 14 months, for instance, these mice do not have amyloid or tau pathology. Um, they're still aging, perhaps still developing it. So that's worth, worth keeping in mind as we look through some of the omics data and, and ask whether we're hitting the right pathways with these models. Here's what the uh, data look like from the nanostring um, uh, technology. And as I mentioned, it's exported basically as a flat file. You can load it up into Excel like I did here, see all your samples, um, see all the technical information, meta information, um, get useful metrics like the binding density, for instance, telling you uh, how, how well the uh, a sample worked in the encounter machine. It gives you your housekeeping genes and then a number of genes that you've selected to put onto the panel. And I'm showing you the first few here. And you can see that we have very clear quantification across all of these samples of all of these genes. Okay, that's an easy data set to work, work with. These come in, by the way, batches of 12. So we did all of these in, in runs of 12 samples each, and we get a number of, of series of uh, flat files like this, which are easily uh, imported and analyzed. How do we analyze it? So we thought about a couple of ways to do this. The first analysis was to model just by factor. Okay, so we have a number of variables here in our data set. We have sex, we have age, and we have a couple of genetic mutations, and we also have a double mutant. So we've mixed those in some cases. Okay, so first to ask, what are the effects of all of these factors? We just took the log of expression estimated by the encounter technology um, and ran a re regression model to assess the effects independent effects from each of these factors, sex, age, APOE4 allele, trem 2 r 47 h allele. If we do that, we can see differential expression by factor pretty clearly. So for instance, we have uh, sex-related genes. So uh, I believe this is males relative to females. We have a number of genes both up and down regulated in the left-hand volcano plot, 149 genes in total. Age-related genes, um, we see stronger effects um, and more significant effects across 338 genes. For the APOE4 knock-in, we see fewer genes affected, 77, mostly upregulated, but some downregulated. And finally, for the TREM2 R47H mutation, we see 133 significantly differentially expressed genes, um, both up and down. And again, this is out of 800 probes, 800 genes that were on this assay. So we are seeing some effects. Um, not surprisingly, we see strong sex and age effects. Um, so that has to be uh, folded into our analysis as well. We then wanted to align from the human data, or sorry, from the mouse data back to the human data. And for this, um, I mean, we did a number of methods. We did the first thing that most people do, which is to look and see if there's an overlap between differential expression in our data set and the human data set. And sure enough, we see a lot of overlap um, 
for instance, doing a Fisher's exact test for uh, for count overlaps, we see a lot of significance. We can do things like uh, Jacquard similarity across the gene sets. Um, that also uh, gives us um, some strong, uh, significant results, and and that's that's good. But we really want to move forward and ask: Well, if if we see that overlap, are we seeing the same effects? Are we seeing genes upregulated in Alzheimer's disease also up in the mouse? Or are we seeing opposite effects in the mouse? Or are we not seeing coherent effects within a given module? Okay, so to assess this, we developed correlation scores, where we're basically just looking at Pearson correlations of uh, the effects in cases versus control in humans versus the effects of a given mouse factor. Okay, so here I'm showing a couple of results where we plot on the x-axis the log fold change in Alzheimer's versus non-Alzheimer's controls in the human genes and the human module. Um, versus a given mouse factor from the linear module. So that could be sex, it could be age, it could be APOE4 or TREM2. And we just compute the correlation between the human gene uh, expression log fold change and the mouse gene expression effect. And so here are two examples. One's an uncorrelated module. So the PHD turquoise module, shown here on the left, uh, we selected the genes in that module that are represented as probes. Uh, on the uh, mouse AD panel and plotted them all against one another in a scatter plot. Here, comparing uh, the uh, human expression versus the effect from the APOE4 allele. And you can see that there's no correlation there that's significant. Um, the correlation is 0 0.084. With these numbers, that's not remotely what we would call significant. And so we'd call that an uncorrelated module for that factor, APOE4, and that, uh, that human module, PhD turquoise. On the other hand, when we look at the trem 2 r 7 h effect and compare it to a different module, STG turquoise, um, we see a strong correlation and a very significant correlation between those two. Okay, so this is suggesting that that module, uh, which I believe is an inflammatory module, uh, is, um, is recapitulated to some degree by the trem 2 r 47 h mouse mutation. So we did this for all factors across all modules. And the results look something like this. Okay, so I'll walk you through this. First, across the top, we have all of the different human uh, model AD or AMP AD modules. Uh, and they've been grouped in these consensus clusters. So like I showed in the overlap, there were these large blocks of uh, modules with similar gene content. Um, here they're in what we call consensus clusters. And we can go through and annotate those consensus clusters as we've done here um, by certain um, biological annotations and or cell types. So for instance, cytokine cluster, uh, consensus cluster B is cytokine signaling and big immune response. That's really microglial. Consensus C is synaptic signaling, nervous system development, which you know, given the way that gene ontology annotations work, that really means we're looking at uh, neuron genes here in this context. Um, consensus cluster D is myelination, uh, neuron uh, and glial development in astrocytes, so that more mixed module um, uh, with oligodendrocyte signals as well. And then finally, the, the uh, consensus cluster here, which has sort of the stress response that shows up cell cycle, DNA repair, and RNA metabolism, uh, gene ontology annotations. So we have those blocks of modules that are all quite similar across human. And then down the left, we're looking at three different mouse ages. Um, and looking at the different factors. So age has such a strong effect, we found that it made more sense to present results separated by age. So now we look, stratified by age, we look at effects from the APOE4 knock-in, the effects of um, male versus female sex. I believe this is male coded as one. So these are male differences from a female baseline. Um, and finally, the trem 2 r 47 h point mutation. And then we systematically computed these correlation scores and saw that we have either positive correlations in blue or negative correlations in red um, across all of these different modules. Okay. And so when you step back, I think the first interesting thing to note is that we tend to be overlapping more with these AMP-AD modules, which I remind you are post-mortem samples from aged individuals in the older mice, in the 14-month-old mouse. We tend to get more overlap, stronger associations, stronger correlations. Most of those are negative. And, and that, again, goes back to the idea that these mice actually don't have the pathological load that we saw in the human samples. Um, and so maybe you know, in some cases, we're not seeing the response, for instance, an immune response um, that one sees due to amyloid in the brain in the humans is not showing up as well here. And in fact, we're seeing an anti-correlation with trem 2 r 47 h and the immune response consensus cluster B. And, and that suggests to us that we're hitting the right pathway there. 
we're hitting the right process, but because there is no pathology in these mouse brains, we're actually seeing it go in a different direction. So it'll be very interesting to see as we develop mice or age mice that develop these uh, pathologies, such as amyloid and tau, um, what the effect of this variant will be. I think we've already hit the right pathway. We'll then see if we're hitting the right direction. In some cases here, we're all already hitting the right direction. For instance, in consensus cluster C, sort of the neuron health series of modules, our APOE4 module, um, uh, APOE4 mutation, that knock-in, already matches pretty well what we're seeing there between the mouse and human. And so that, that's powerful information because now we know that if we really want to study the most Alzheimer's relevant instances of uh, the pathology represented by consensus cluster C, that APOE4 mouse is already a useful mouse to carry forward and, and study that. Um, the other thing I'll note is that we sometimes see some changes in the correlations with age as well. And, and that shows up in the APOE4 mouse on this far right consensus cluster E, where early you see a correlation with, uh, with some of the Alzheimer's related pathology, but that goes negative as you, as you go later. And again, that could be a, an issue of insufficient aging and or pathology in the mouse, um, or it could be that the APOE4 genetic factor actually is not contributing and is, is not um, correlated with those modules later in life. So we'll, we'll find, find out more as we age these mice and add additional pathology driving mutations. We can also catalog strains versus these different modules. And so this is the same set of modules again, grouped in the same way, but instead of pulling out the linear model um, effects that I, I showed from the mice earlier, we just assess every single mouse strain. Again, we have six replicates, so we can actually do this with fairly high confidence. Look at what does an APOE4 male look like, an APOE4 TREM2 double mutant male versus female, TREM2 male. And the idea here is if you really want to do a preclinical follow-up or a, a detailed experimental follow-up, this is a way that you can select that mouse that's going to best match the pathology that you're most interested in. Okay. And so you can see that, again, we see pretty similar correlations and strength of correlations in both positive and negative directions um, for each of these mice with each of these modules. Um, but there's some additional information here. For instance, that consensus cluster C that has correlation with the APOE4, that actually a correlation is really in the male mice and not so much in the female mice, at least not at a significant level. Okay, so one might want to study both males and females if you're studying that pathway with the APOE4 mouse and see if that any effects that you're following up on are going to match this, this sex-specific effect that we're seeing in the mouse. It also tells you that, for instance, if you want to think about these uh, stress response uh, um, outcomes in consensus cluster three, the TREM2 females are really where you want to look, either at um, middle or later ages. And so by, by doing this analysis, and this is, again, all with the nanostring uh, uh, mouse AD platform, um, we can get a quick idea of what these mouse models are, are showing relative to the human modules. We've also done RNA-seq on these same mice, sort of as proof of concept in a pilot, we wanted to do RNA-seq as well. And we did the same analysis, went through all the different strains compared to all these different mouse mod or human modules from AMP-AD. Of course, here we can do it with a full repertoire of all the genes in these modules. Um, and so the results look very similar when you look across the board. Um, one notable thing, of course, is that the correlations get weaker when you look across all the genes, right? Because many of these genes are more peripheral to the modules um, and are maybe are not showing as robust an effect. And so that's it, perhaps uh, uh, initiating some noise in, into the correlation analysis, which weakens the correlations. At the same time, the number of genes is higher, so the significance uh, stays there. Um, and so that's interesting to note that the, with the, the mouse AD panel from nanostring, we actually see twice the uh, level of correlation, basically, after we've selected out the most relevant genes. But otherwise, we see very similar effects across all of the strains and all the various human um, clusters. And we, and we summarize this with a plot showing how well each of these correlation scores match between human and mouse in RNA-seq versus nanostring. So basically, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a scatter plot of these outcomes here, these correlation scores across the grid. And they look like this. Okay, so this is back to the factor analysis where I'm not going strain by strain. I got a little busy. So here I'm just showing the different factors, age, APOE4 sex, and trem 2 r 47 h factors. Um, looking across modules, uh, module, uh, that is um, AMP-AD module to mouse factor correlation scores in RNA-seq on the x-axis. And the same thing 
for the mouse AD panel and the Y axis. And so you can see that there's a very strong correlation there, um, definitely a significant correlation, um, suggesting that you know, for, for the purposes that we've set out here, which is to compare the mouse signals with the human signals, um, we're basically getting the same result when we compare uh, using RNA-seq or the mouse AD panel. Um, again, I also noted earlier that you tend to get the stronger correlations with the AD panel because we narrow down to the, the strongest, most central genes to each of those modules. And so the Y axis has a broader scale than the X axis. Um, interestingly, this also improves with age. You can see some of the strongest correlations are that age factor. And if we stratify by age and look at all these, uh, this, this relationship again, we see that as the mice age, and hopefully, and, and it appears that it is the case, that the mouse signals become more relevant to the human uh, signals in the FAD aged cohorts, that we're getting not only a better match in both cases with the human data, but we're also getting better agreement with the different experimental platforms, RNA-seq and mouse AD panel. Okay. So we, we think we have a very good panel to move forward with uh, as we create and age more mice um, within Model AD, and we'll be doing this um, all along and sharing that data as we do it. So all of our data are available through that same AMP AD portal that I showed earlier. We collaborate closely with the AMP AD consortium, and we're in fact using their same data dissemination platform, uh, which is ampadportal.org. Um, here is the example showing uh, some of our contributions on their webpage. Um, but you can go there, you can link to data. We just uh, posted new data from some mouse models on here, and, and we'll do that continuously over the years. Um, we also link to these data on our own site, model-ad.org. The panel is available as well. So the Encounter Mouse AD panel is available today from Nanostream. Um, we're using it. You can too. Um, and there's a human version coming as well. So if you have uh, human cohorts that you'd like to screen in the same way, um, that panel will arrive. Again, it's 770 genes. They're specific for Alzheimer's disease studies, um, assessed from 30 AD associated gene co-expression modules, as I've described, um, that represent in here, we're naming 23 different neurodegeneration pathway and processes. And so that allows, again, reproducible monitoring of Alzheimer's progression with age in the model um, and functional screening of potential therapeutics, because of course you can use this as a validation technique. If you see variation within a given module that you think is a drug target, then you can, of course, do uh, nanostring analysis on your preclinical studies as well and see if the drug is mediating um, that, that targeted pathway. And we're, we're doing some of that, of course, in our preclinical testing core in Model AD. Um, this is, of course, compatible with any mouse model and customizable, again, with those 30 additional user-defined genes. And so we've been doing that because many of these models have, say, a humanized gene or genes with, with a number of SNPs in them, where we want to be able to quantify that targeted genetic mutation um, and, and at high precision as well. And that requires moving away from the standard mouse sequence. Okay, so this is available from Nanostring. And that's where I wanted to wrap up by thanking all of us in the Model ID Consortium, that involves a number of people from Indiana University, the Jackson Laboratory, University of California, Irvine, Sage Bio Networks, and now the University of Pittsburgh. Also thank our collaborators at Nanostring who helped us develop this mouse AD panel and have helped uh, guide our use of it. Um, and finally, our funding source is through the National Institute of Aging, a couple of U54s to fund Model AD. And I'll finish by noting we have a number of contacts. We have modelad.org webpage. We have an email address, modelad at iupui.edu. And we're also on Twitter at modelad halls. Um, Nanostring, of course, can be reached at their own webpage and info at nanostring.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carter, for that informative presentation. I'd also like to thank NanoString for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June 2019. As a final reminder, Dr. Carter will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.